I'm going to start right off this evening with the passage that was just read to us, and it is going to talk about spiritual gifts. And there are several of them that are going to be listed, and we're going to start off by looking at these things. And first of all, I took my title from first verse here in chapter 12, now about spiritual gifts, brothers. I do not want you to be ignorant. So he wanted the church there at Corinth to understand much about what he's having to say. Now, I want to paint a picture for you here as we do begin. As he is dressing the church at Corinth, Paul is having to address a whole lot of problems. There are some very famous passages that we take a look at here in chapters 12, 13, and 14. In chapter 13, you know, there is the section on love, what I call the definition of love, and we go to that over and over and over and over again. And then there is the section that talks about that the church is like a body, that it has a whole lot of different members in it, and each member has a different part in doing that. And so we go to that and we talk about the fact today that there are various gifts that each one of us have here within this congregation, things that have been given to us that we are good at, that we can accomplish good for the cause of God and for the church. But the problem at Corinth is that you had these miraculous gifts that were there and that there were people that I think to some degree were abusing them, but certainly they were not showing the proper amount of love and respect to their fellow believers. And there are certain one of these things that they had a high ambition of having. And if they could get those things, they're going to look down on those that may have had these other ones. And so Paul is really trying to unify the church. I don't know that he really wanted to talk about spiritual gifts. What he wanted to talk about is unity within that church, which is the message of the whole book in its entirety. So he starts off and he's going to talk about what these gifts are. And there's actually two passages here that are going to deal with these. The first one is wisdom. The idea behind wisdom is the ability to understand God's Word and to apply it obediently. I like to say it is the practical application of knowledge. So we have some information, now how are we going to use that information? Well, there were people that had the ability, the miraculous ability, to use that in a right, a right and proper way. The second one is knowledge, and that's the ability to know God's Word, to know the meaning of God's Word. Today, you can know what God's Word says. It comes by study. It comes by effort given on your part. You may be trained in biblical languages. You may be trained in New Testament history, things along that line. Uh, you may take classes to help you understand the theological ideas behind what, from what God's Word is saying. But at that point in time, there are people that would receive that knowledge not by going through the process we just talked about, but to simply know what God's Word said. So by the Spirit, they would know exactly what was God's Word and what wasn't God's Word. The third one that's going to be listed is faith. Well, first of all, you know that it requires faith for every one of us to become a Christian. It's about he that believes and is baptized. We've got to realize that we have accepted the gospel because of grace through faith. So faith is required for every person to become a Christian, but here is a faith that is of a much greater measure. This is the ability to trust God in face of overwhelming obstacles and things that are seemingly impossibilities. I cannot help but think when I think about Jesus talking about that you can say to a mountain, if you have just the faith of a mustard seed, be gone, and it would be. And I think along that line with this particular gift of faith. Then there is healing. As you study the life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see the tremendous amount of healing that Jesus did. 
And then you find that he's gone to send out his apostles and they are going to be able to heal. As you read through the book of Acts, you find that they are healing various individuals. And there is an occasion that he sent out 70 men, two by two. And in that case, these individuals then would also have that power of healing and casting out demons, things along that line. We are talking about things that are miraculous. But I also want you to understand the meaning behind that. John mentioned a miracle this morning, and you look at that miracle, is because Jesus had compassion on that woman. So there is compassion being shown to people because of the situations they were in, but you will find several occasions that lets us know that these miracles were performed so that you knew that these people that were doing it were speaking God's Word. The phrase that we use is to confirm the message. Here's what I have to say to you. And here is proof that this is God's word by the miracles that we have performed. But I also want you to know that there are individuals within Scripture that were sick that were not healed. Not healed miraculously. Certainly you start off with Paul who had the thorn in the flesh and he literally asked God three times to remove that and God said no. Then you read about Epaphrodites. He was so sick that the Apostle Paul thought he was about to die. There was no miracle performed on him, but he was restored back to his health. And the same thing about Trophimus. On one occasion, he was extremely sick as he was on one of these journeys, and he regained his health back once again. And then there is another one that is added to that, and that is miraculous powers. And when I think about that, I think about some of the things that Jesus did. This is not healing, but you could take... He did, took water and changed it to wine. He took a little bit of food and fed over 5,000 men with that. He performed a miracle where there was a coin taken from the mouth of a fish. He performed miracles where there was the casting out of demons. And I believe that these men would have the ability to do things along that line to help out in whatever situation. Well, the next one that we have is the gift of prophecy. Prophecy, a lot of times when I ask what is prophecy, I get the response, well, it's telling what the future is. And primarily that is how most folks talk about that. But I want you to understand that prophecy was just simply to speak whatever message God wanted spoken. And if God wanted to, me to say something that was about two or three hundred years down the road is going to happen, so be it. But you're just simply saying whatever God wanted said. So sometimes there is a prediction in that, a forecast in that, or here is what is going to happen in the future, but most of the time... That's not what's happening. This is the Spirit that's empowering the ability to simply speak what God's Word actually is. Then we have the distinguishing of spirits. If you can recall the last sermon that I did preach on a Sunday morning, in that particular lesson we went to 1 John chapter 4, and I gave you three tests about whether you should listen to someone or not, whether they had the right spirit about themselves or not. And the first one is, what did they have to say about Jesus? If they denied that Jesus came in the flesh, you don't listen to them. Well, there were so many things that people could say, and they'd be speaking that out of their own mind, but claiming that God told me that, that the ability to determine whether someone was really speaking God's Word or wasn't speaking God's Word was given to some individuals. Very simply, they could recognize lying spirits. They knew whether that individual was lying to the church or not. The next one is the speaking in tongues. When I began to study this and look at this, I very much believe, and you get the start of this in Acts chapter 2, it's just simply speaking God's word in another language, another language you had not studied. This is one of the problems of the church of Corinth. 
they were fascinated with this one. And today a lot of folks are absolutely fascinated with this one. And they want to be able to speak in tongues. And one of the young men at that time that I would talk with a whole lot back when I did live in Illinois, he believed in that, and he believed that there were people at his church who could do that, and, and he wanted to do that oh so bad. And I remember him saying to me, if I could just speak in tongues, I know I'd be right with God. So he was looking for that as a sign for himself of his salvation. But I believe the way that it was used there on the day of Pentecost, the scriptures announced about 15 different countries that were there. I suspect there may have been even more. So there are a lot of languages that were gathered there together. And if Peter got up and just spoke in the Greek language, a lot of folks wouldn't know what he's saying. And I want you to stop and to think tonight, I don't think anybody in here knows Chinese, but if I were to get up here tonight and I'd say this sermon to you in Chinese, what good would it do you? I wouldn't understand a word that I said, unless you happen to know that language. And the last one that he mentions right here was the interpretation of tongues. And so the idea behind that is I may not speak in tongues, but when I hear this person speaking in tongues, I can interpret that for you and tell you exactly what that person just said. So here is this list that Paul has given us. And the question I would want you to stop and to think about, what was their purpose? All of these things were to build up the church as the church is still in its infancy. It took many years to have the New Testament compiled like what you and I have. I want you to stop and think what it had been like there on the day of Pentecost for you to hear, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you do that. Now what? Now what? And that's going to occur in city after city after city after city after city. And the church needed to know what it is exactly that God wanted and expected out of them and that is the reason that we find these spiritual gifts. Now I drop down in the same chapter just a little bit further, and you're going to see some more gifts that are going to be mentioned. And the top of that list is apostles. Do you know of anyone that says that they have an apostle where they worship? There are people that do that today. The word apostle literally means one that is sent on a mission. But when I began to study in Scripture, I find that all of these men were handpicked by Jesus. There were 12 men. One of them, Judas Iscariot, committed suicide, and he was replaced. And the Lord played a role in that as well. We also find that at a later time that the apostle Paul said that he was also chosen when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus as one that was born out of due time. In Acts chapter 1, verses 22 to 24, tells us exactly what was required in order to be an apostle. First, you picked by the Lord. But secondly, it said that you had to observe Jesus' earthly ministry, and you had to be a witness of His resurrection. So when you use the word apostle as it was used of these 12 men, there is not a man that fits that description in this day and time. These men from the very beginning, they're on the day of Pentecost, and from that point on, they could perform miracles, signs, and wonders. The second one that is going to be mentioned is prophets once again. Again, these are men that would always speak for God, they did not always reveal a new message. Sometimes they did. When you go to Ephesians chapter 4, you will find that the apostles and the prophets, that they were to equip the church, that they were to lay the foundation as far as the church was concerned. The next one is teachers. And certainly there are teachers today, but 
Again, I believe we're talking about from a miraculous standpoint, just as we looked at in the previous list. There are people that know what God's Word has been revealed to them, and then they are using that and presenting that material to the church. Workers of miracles. That may be the healing, or that may be some of these other things that we've mentioned already, but there's something very special that has taken place and it is a miraculous power. It goes against what the laws of nature are. I've studied miracles a lot, and what I find so many times that the word miracle is used so loosely in this day and time. A miracle is something that is very obviously happened at the hands of God and goes against what the laws of nature are all about. There is the healing. People were given the ability to speak the words or to touch someone and whatever sickness that was there, whatever disease that was there, it now is gone. And then there is a very simple one there. And I think this is something that you and I can do today, but I believe that this is being used as something very miraculous at that point in time as well. It was the idea to help others. Everybody in this room that's a Christian can help someone else. But I believe there's something very special about what is being talked about here. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, we, we know this as the passage where Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But right before that, the apostle Paul said that one of his jobs was to help the weak. Help the weak. And I know that the Apostle Paul had miraculous abilities to do that. And I believe that's what it's referring to right here. But you and I today can still help others. And then there is the gifted administration. The administration, that word, phrase really means literally to steer the ship. You show the ship which way it needs to go. And so here he is referring to that there were going to be gifts that would allow there to be leadership, people to know what to do to steer the church in the right direction there in the first century. And then he comes back with the idea of speaking in different tongues, again, different languages as well. Well, I want to go to the 13th chapter now. And in the 13th chapter... I want you to see that he's pointing out again, there is a misunderstanding of what they are doing and how they are using that. And this is the introduction to the definition of love that falls in verses 4 through 8. And in this passage, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess for the poor or to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. So he talks about four of these spiritual gifts here. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, and faith. And he simply is saying is if you don't have the right attitude about yourself, it's meaningless. And that's what was taking place in the church at Corinth. They were destroying the usage of this and the meaning of this by their attitudes towards one another. We move now to verses 8 through 12. We've got to have love. Why? The last phrase about love is love never fails. You can't go wrong with love. And we as God's people are to be people of love and we serve a God who is love. And again, he is saying, you are not doing that at Corinth. But then he says this, But where there are prophecies, they will cease. 
where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. But now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Paul doesn't come out and say exactly when these things are going to come to an end. But he says prophecies are going to cease. Tongues, they're not going to happen anymore. And knowledge is going to pass away. Now, what is he talking about that? He's talking about that miraculous gift of knowledge that someone just knows what God's Word is without the studying of that. When will that take place? Well, he says that there is a time when perfection comes. This is difficult to understand. And there are a lot of folks that have a lot of different ideas about this. I don't know that I can pinpoint to you and say this is exactly what it is, but there are some things that I believe that is not. There are a lot of folks that like to say that it's Jesus, when Jesus comes again. Was Jesus perfect? Absolutely. But the language right here is referring to an it. It's not referring to a he, it's referring to an it. And so that could not be Jesus. There are those that think it's heaven. Is heaven going to be a perfect place? Absolutely. God's going to be there. Jesus is going to be there. The Spirit's going to be there. The holy angels are going to be there. All the saints that have been made perfect are going to be there. No sin going to be in that location. But there again, it's hard to pinpoint what's being referred to there. Some say it is the mature church. Some are simply saying, which would tie in very closely to heaven, it's just simply eternity. And then there are many, and I, I guess I lean more towards this than to anything, and, and that's simply the scriptures. When we really know the entirety of what God's word is about, then there's no need for those gifts. So it is something that I continue to study and I continue to read upon. I wouldn't be dogmatic upon that, but I do believe that, yes, we're showing you these things were going to disappear. Ephesians 4, 11, or 12 and 13 are going to help us to understand that as well. He's going to talk about the apostles. He's going to talk about the prophets. He's going to talk about the pastor and teachers and a couple of other situations right there. Why did they have those in the early days of the church? Paul told them to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Built up when? Until we all reach unity and faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So when did we have the entirety of the Bible? Well, the last book to be written was Revelation. And there are those that argue that it was shortly before 70 A.D., and then there are those that argue it was as late as 90 A.D. At the very latest, from the 90s on, we have had the entirety of what God's Word is all about. Now, Paul has also given us some more reasoning here about this. What's all this talk about? When I was a child, I thought like a child, I talked like a child, and I reasoned like a child. Well, a child grows up. And the way they talk, and the way they think, and the way they reason, it matures. And I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say as well. The church is still in its infancy, we're still trying to get all of this together so that we'll know exactly what God wants.
When I read in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25, Philip going and meeting the man that was known as Simon the sorcerer, we find that this man wanted to become a Christian. He had been very, very good at his sorcery, and people had called him a higher power, and he just smiled at that. He enjoyed that. But he had seen the miracles by Philip. But he had not received the Spirit. We find that there is two of the apostles came to that location because they heard about the success. And when you look at this passage, it says that Simon saw that the Spirit, this is the miraculous gifts, came about by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, as I think this week, I'm trying to think, did the apostle Paul give out all these gifts when he first came to Corinth? Or was it the Spirit actually gave some of these out from time to time to time? But it becomes very obvious when you make a very clear study of this that the apostles had that ability to pass that on. Nowhere will you find that there was anyone else other than the apostles had the ability to pass that on. And if that be the case, the necessity is that it will die out. The last miracle, as best I understand it, that's recorded in Scripture is found in Acts chapter 28 and verse 8 where Paul healed the man by the name of Publius. This man was sick. And he spoke the words and made the man well. Just before that, he had been bitten by a poisonous snake and suffered no effects from that. And from my understanding, that occurred around 58 A.D. But you read the rest of the letters, there's not a mention of a miracle. You go to even to the last book, there's not the mention of these miracles. So I think that that is something else that helps us to understand that these are things just like what Paul said are gone to pass away. I also want to give you three church historians what they said. Origen, who lived from 184 to 253, he said the sign gifts of the apostolic age were temporary and were not exercised by Christians of his day. These things we just read through, he he says, that's not happening. Chrysostom, in 347 to 407 he lived. He says tongues and the other miraculous gifts not only has ceased, but could not even accurately be defined. That's like me and you reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I try to give you an understanding of all that as best I can. But here's a man in the 300s saying, I can't even really tell you what those things were like at that time. Augustine in 354 to 430, talking about tongues, says these were signs adapted to that time for their behooved to be that betokening. That means a sign of the Holy Spirit that things were done for the betokening, and it passed away. Do you realize that there is absolutely no mention of these times of spiritual gifts until you hit the 17th and 18th century? So for over 1,800 years, as church historians are recording things, there's no mention of this whatsoever. But in the early 20th century, there began to be an emphasis, and a lot of us here in the United States, in what is known as a holiness movement. And then in the 1960s, in the early days of my life, there began what was known as the United States Charismatic Movement, which began in Pentecostalism and did spread to some other denominations. So when you hear about these things, or you tell, as someone tells you that this is taking place at their church, this is a recent phenomenon. It was there in the infancy of the church, 
and went through a long period of time that there's no evidence of it. And now you find people saying today that it is there. Well, one more thing that I want to point out to you here. There is a presentation by Paul here in chapter 14 about prophecy and tongues. And what Paul will simply say is that prophecy is a greater gift. The church thought tongues was the greater gift. Oh, I want to be able to speak this. So he gives some things for us to think about in the comparison of these two things. On the left you have what he says about prophecy, and on the right you have what he said about tongues. Prophecy was for strengthening the church, for the encouragement of the church, for the comfort of the church. And I think about that, all three of those words would apply to me if I'm wondering, is somebody really telling me the truth or not? And I know that someone really has that gift of prophecy, that they're really speaking what God wants. Those three words would be felt in my soul. But he said about tongues, no one understands. So let's just say at that day and time that someone there in the church at Corinth could speak in English. Who in there would understand English? No one. No one. Paul then says that prophecy will edify the church. It will teach the church. It will build up the church. It is a benefit to the church. But when it comes to tongues, the only one that gets anything out of it is the person that's doing it because they could say, like they were doing it, court, look at me, I can speak in tongues. So they were calling all the attention to themselves. Paul then comes out and says that prophecy is for believers. But tongues were a sign for unbelievers. So suppose I am going to speak in a foreign language and here is a man or a woman that understands what I said. Well, when did you study my language? I didn't. That would be a sign to them that you can now communicate with me in a language that you have not studied. Paul goes ahead to say this. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to exceed in gifts that build up the church. Church wasn't doing that. And that's the whole reason for these three chapters. The final thing that I want you to understand is that there are some actual rules that are given for this as well. And I've not been around much of this as a late teenage years in my early 20s. I had the opportunity on a few occasions where I had individuals, I invited them to church and they said, well, I'll go with you if you'll go with me. And so I went and I observed what was taking place. And on one occasion, I was called a devil for what I did. <laughs> but I will tell you what I have seen doesn't fit what's being said here. Whatever gift you are using is to be used to strengthen the church. And if you are going to speak in tongues, no more than three people at an assembly, and one at a time. And I've heard what sounded to me like Indian chants, happening over here, happening over here, happening over here. It's just all over the place. And the rule is that if you are going to speak in a tongue, don't you do it unless there is somebody there that can interpret what you are saying. And there's rules for the prophets as well. When you begin to speak, no more than two or three of you may do that. And if you realize someone else is receiving that message from God, you sit down. You let the other person say 
One of the two places that talks about women to remain silent in the assemblies is right here in this. And I myself personally have never heard a man say that he was speaking in tongues. Every time that I have ever heard that, it was a woman doing that. That's not to say there aren't men that will say they'll do it. But me personally, that's what I've heard. And the final thing that I point out from this is that Paul makes this very clear. The subject, or rather the spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So don't say to me, I just got to do this, I just got to do this. No, you don't. You are still in control of yourself. And yet you will find many folks that will use that line of reasoning. God spoke to me and I had to say this or I had to speak in this tongue or this is what I had to do. So what you find being done today is far different than what's being done in scriptures. It's not a subject we talk about. It is a subject that is difficult to understand in its entirety. It is a subject that will require continuous thought. But it is something that if you're telling people about Jesus Christ, you will eventually, if not very quickly, run into this subject. And we need to know why we do what we do. So that's why I presented that lesson to you here this evening. The good news is, is that every one of us that is a Christian does have the gift of the Spirit. Not these miraculous gifts, but we have the Spirit lives in us by becoming a Christian. So tonight I ask you, have you done what the Lord has asked you to do? Have you repented of your sins, confessed His name before people? Have you been buried in baptism so that your sins will be washed away? That's when you will receive the gift of the Spirit. And that's such an important aspect of our life. We sometimes shy away from that because of this talk of the miraculous. But it's such a valuable gift to us. Ephesians says it is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. We have it. I'm glad that we have it because of that guarantee. So tonight, if we can help you become a Christian, if you need our prayers in any form or fashion, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.